It's 10 10 now, right? Right? Is it? Yeah, it's 10 11. Okay, whenever. Whenever you're. I think we're. Sorry, can you say your last name again? Friend Goodies. Friend Goodies, okay, thank you. Oh, yeah. Okay. Hey, hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Melody. I'm on the Star State Committee, and our speaker today is a front end um, developer specializing in augmented reality experiences for, at Lifar. We build AR experiences for prototype clients, including Forceo, Mills, Coca Cola, One Direction, and L'Oreal. Please join me in welcoming Fermi Frangudi. Hey, how's it going, everyone? Um, so, I guess I'll start off by talking a little bit about myself and Penn State and Startup Week. Startup Week kind of holds like a really close place in my heart because it's how I found my current job at Blipper. Uh, I started at Penn State years ago, took some time off, thought I could do the startup thing. That failed miserably, but you know, chase your dreams, you'll learn a lot. The one thing I did learn is I really wanted to go work for a startup. Super flexible, people are laid back, like you know, you work hard, you get rewarded for it. So. I definitely would advocate if you're looking at the startup world, definitely, definitely apply. It's, it's a good, good time. So what is AR? What is VR? Augmented reality is putting virtual objects into your world and then letting you interact with it, whereas virtual reality replaces your world with those same virtual concepts. So they're kind of like brother and sister. They're, they're cut from the same mold kind of thing. Am I going too far away? Sorry. Um, so a lot of the skill sets that you would have for AR, you could, you could reuse in VR. I'm not really going to talk about VR today, but just so you know, it's, they're, they're very similar. So in AR, one of the biggest things you have is computer vision. You can't have real AR without computer vision because it's just things floating around you. So in order to give context to what you're looking at, either as uh, marker-based tracking or whatever, you need some sort of understanding of what the camera is seeing, whether it's you know, an image or a video feed or whatever. Computer vision is kind of like at the heart of augmented reality. Not so much in virtual reality because you know, the world doesn't matter. We put you in a fake one. That's why it's lame. Um, so. Feature point recognition, which is kind of like the most common AR you've seen, uses a marker, distinguishes certain features of that marker and looks for it within the, the video feed that it's getting fed. This is kind of, not kind of, it's, it's just really impactful for brands and what I do for a living because you're, you're tying the product back to the experience. For more general AR, the marker-based recognition isn't, isn't like, a, the only way to go. So aside from marker-based, you have SLAM, which includes your AR kit, your AR core. It's simultaneously location and localization and mapping, meaning taking your understanding of what the world is and where that camera or device sits in the world, understanding that there's depth, using the gyros, the accelerometers, everything to understand how the phone is rotating so that along with the image data that's coming through, it can pinpoint different features in that world and allow the user to, to move around it. And this is really gonna be the future of uh, augmented reality because no longer are you tied to a single you know, piece of paper or collateral. You're now talking about immersively, or immersing the user, sorry, in, in the augmented world. So from there, there's also facial tracking. I'm sure everyone recognizes this is from Snapchat. It's, it's pretty wild, the, computer, the amount of computer vision that goes into tracking your face. Understanding that your brow is always shaded slightly lighter than the sides of your face, how the nose crease is shaded in the image. So they're using all sorts of machine, uh, sorry, AI algorithms to understand all these feature points in your face and then adjust from their model 
to what it's seeing in the, in the frame. So when you see those little filters that are coming on your face, that's hundreds of millions of dollars worth of work. And slowly but surely, that'll, that'll become you know, $10 worth of work because of the way technology and AI is moving. Um, now Apple and IBM, I think, have teamed up to allow Watson's AI to be embedded using their machine learning algorithms on device. So you're going to be seeing some really cool stuff coming out with AI and feature point tracking beyond just the face. There's also non-visual augmentation. So I don't know if you guys heard about Bose. They debuted these cool little sunglasses that don't overlay anything into your world. They just understand where you are in your world and then give you audio that tells you, okay, you're looking at this place, here are the Yelp reviews. So it's a completely different type of augmentation, but something I feel is going to be growing in the next few years. Uh, also, Google's you know, on-the-fly translating. Can you imagine standing in a room with someone that doesn't even speak the same language as you and being able to communicate in real time without having to type? It's insane. You know, and, and it's a form of aug augmented reality because it's not, you know, without that computer there, that, that wouldn't be possible. So here's the different use cases for, for augmented reality, going from the most popular to the, to the hardest to achieve, actually. So entertainment, everyone knows Pokemon Go. That was the big sensation. I don't think anyone's done it quite as good as Pokemon Go in terms of, like, entertainment. Uh, education and social awareness kind of go hand in hand. There's a lot of people trying to work on projects that, that teach you stuff. Um, up here in the front, there's a couple handouts. This one, if you scan it using the Blipper app, it'll give you a little 3D uh, volcano. You could label the different layers, a way to show people kind of what, what a volcano looks like. This one's interesting. It uses uh, your, gyro, your, your phone's accelerometer and gyroscope to place planets around you. And then as you look around, you can see how they move in relation to each other. Uh, so it's kind of the education portion of it. Social awareness, we worked with this artist called Priya Shakti, who's raising awareness about social injustices in India. There's a whole comic series about it. The artist uses our tools to augment the comic books, which is pretty cool. So not only are you reading it, but you can, you can get a, another dimension to the experience. Commerce, you might have heard of ModiFace. They were recently bought by L'Oreal. They do face tracking, hair tracking, uh, virtual try-on for makeup. Really cool stuff. They're, they're going to be pushing it in the next, next few years. Utility, that's the hardest one to crack. And I don't think anyone's quite cracked it yet because, you know, otherwise we'd all be using augmented reality every day of our lives, you know, <laughs> for the work we do. But one of the, the places we're going with utility is such things as navigation. Blipper has a, a little spin-off spin -off project that we did called um, AR Cities, where using photographs of the cities, kind of like Google Street View, we ingested them into our computer vision AI, and we could tell you where you are in that city with greater accuracy than GPS without the expense of GPS, which is pretty cool. We'll overlay different uh, navigation routes, things that you could see around town. This isn't actually from AR, AR cities because I don't live in a city that we've mapped. But this is kind of the idea of it. Like, you'll be walking around. Who knows, one day we won't even have cell phones. We'll be wearing eyeglasses or things that project into our eyes, whatever. And we'll be able to interact with AR pieces around us, which would be really cool. So what are the skills that you would need to go into AR? You have to have an understanding of spatial awareness. That's number one. Understanding that no longer is there a screen in front of you. You're, you're placing your program, your app, everything in the world around your user, not in front of them. So if you have a button up here, how do you direct the user to look up, to look left, to look right, to kind of flow through the experience in a different way than you've ever really imagined? Second, 3D modeling. You don't have to know how to model, but you have to understand what it takes, like understand poly counts, um, the different types of modeling, whether it's photo geometry or it's uh, modeled 
you know, from a cube, and then 3D animation. How do those, is it just a translation? Is it a complex deformation? Is it, you know, a boned animation? So while you don't have to be able to do those skills, those are the kind of things that, that come into play every day in our workflow. Obviously, you gotta know how to code if you wanna write AR experiences. You know, nothing's gonna write it for you. Have an understanding of mobile platforms because even if you use something like Unity or Unreal or whatever other engine comes out, everything compiles down to a mobile app, APK, API, whatever. Um, so sometimes those plugins don't like to play well with each other. You gotta have an understanding kind of how that all works. Plus, we're working on mobile, so it's like going back to the old computers. Dr. Rimlin will probably remember where you actually have to be memory conscious and, you know, don't, don't load too much all at once kind of stuff. AI, that's, uh, you have to have an understanding of where the, the artificial intelligence is going, like the, the field, the technology, you know, can they track a car, can they track a face, can you recognize a car, can you recognize a chair, can I recognize that your shirt's purple and your shirt's gray and your shirt's blue. So just understanding that those, you know, technologies exist and I know that's probably not the color of your shirt, but. <laughs> this is the AR landscape. It's a lot more crowded than anyone would ever have guessed. You've probably heard of players in this world, in this world, in this world, but maybe a little less in, in these bottom worlds. Uh, I'm gonna focus on some of the big players, which are Apple, Facebook, Snapchat, Google, Flipper. Uh, so, well, here's the landscape. I guess I threw this slide kind of in the middle there. Um, if you're gonna be doing AR programming apps, here's some, some cool little things to check out. Turbo Squid, it's, it's a marketplace where you can buy 3D models. People make them, they sell them. Sometimes they're cheap, sometimes they're not. But it'll save you a whole lot of headaches sometimes when, when you're looking for, for just a guy walking down the street and you don't wanna have to sit there and model it. CG Trader, the same thing. Sketchfab, that's another Big one, I've seen downloadable models for pay, downloadable models for free. It's, it's really kind of emerging and they have a ton of content. So I would, I would keep an eye on Sketchfab. Mixamo, if you buy into the Adobe suite, they have this great 3D character animation um, suite called Mi Mixamo. Unreal and Unity, they are cross-platform development tools that allow not only for you to preview your 3D models, but script them. You can do visual scripting, which is that middle, so you don't even need to really know how to write code. You can drag the widgets down and connect everything through, through a visual script. And then there's AR Studio and Lens Studio, Facebook and Snapchat's uh, latest platform editions. The last two are really cool and you might be really interested in them because not only are they free, they're also JavaScript based. So all that cool face tracking stuff you've seen on Facebook, it's all JavaScript. They got tons of examples, really easy to do some really cool stuff. And that's the one thing you gotta realize about AR is it's in such an infancy, even the simplest stuff is just like wow worthy if it's done right. So definitely worth checking them out. AR Studio focuses, that's Facebook, focuses solely on the face. Lens Studio focuses solely on slam style tracking of the world around you. So you, you don't actually get to tap into Snapchat's face filters, but hopefully that's coming along sometime soon. Uh, so what I do at Blipper is I'm a front end developer. I lead the New York team. So any AR experiences that are done for the US market it's my responsibility to make sure that they're scoped right, they come in, they go through the development process properly, and they make it out the door on time. That's the killer, on time. We're not allowed to fail, we're not allowed to be late. You know, it's not like school where you're like, oh, Dr. Rimlin, I was up all night, I didn't make it, is it cool if I, you know, turn it in later? We don't get that luxury, because we'll do 
uh, like event-based deployments. So we did one for M&M's is caramel flavor. I don't know if you guys heard about that. They put the, the caramel in there. So for that, they activated Times Square. At the time when we got the, the proposal, we didn't realize how big of an event this was going to be. We thought, oh, they're going to activate some billboards and people are going to go and scan. They're like, no, we got people, we have stands. It was a, f I don't know, it was like half a million dollar engagement. They rented out Times Square. They put up three d like, like booths that mimicked arcades and you would stand where the screen was and point out. So it's kind of like unboxing the square. It, it, it was a fun experience, but that was a big one that we learned a lot about being on time because we had a team in India that was helping us supplement some of the work. Well, it's a startup. You know, if, if the office isn't bringing in the money, eventually they get shut down. It's also a startup, so the communications aren't the best all the time. So we didn't find out until about three weeks before the, the go live date and they didn't have any usable code, so we had to all-nighter it for two weeks and, and produce. But, you know, when we got there, it, it made it all worth it. You're, you're, you're sitting there and the engagement is so huge, you're like, it's a good thing I stayed up. This would have been really embarrassing if we didn't deliver. <laughs> so that's, that's kind of like what we do there. We, we bring the physical world to the digital world. Um, this is an old slide. We found out about two weeks ago, I mentioned this last year, startups do a lot of pivoting. We started as an AR company, we pivoted it to a visual search company. Well, we pivoted back to an AR company. So while visual search and visual discovery and computer vision do play a huge role in Blipper's you know, ambitions, we've realized you can't index the world, not at least at our level, without a lot, a lot of money. And that's what we were trying to do with our visual search not only understand that that's a table, but that's a table from XYZ place and has all these dimensions, whatever. So now we're focused more on being that AR layer for everyone's apps. We've released an SDK, it's cross-platform, so there's an iOS and an Android version. You can embed it in your app, really simple. We have it's a couple lines of code, opens up the camera view, SDK does the rest. We have cloud-based a, a cloud-based CMS, so you upload your JavaScript file, single JavaScript file, single code base, and it's deployed via the cloud to both platforms, which is really cool. So it's a cross-platform OpenGL render engine written in C++, if anyone cares. <laughs> um, so what can we make blippable? This is where the power of our computer vision technology, and this is one of the places that Blipper kind of leads the game, is our computer vision in terms of recognizing objects that don't have some sort of QR code or, or uh, watermark embedded. So if you used, uh, what's their name? The Shazam, yeah, the audio ones. So Shazam has visual recognition. What they don't tell you is those posters have been printed using Q, or with embedded QR codes that you can't see. So inside their camera view, they're applying all these photo filters to find that, that QR code and spawn you that experience. Which, you know, to you, you might not notice it, but to a brand that you're trying to bring augmented reality to, and you're like, yeah, you got to reprint everything. That no one's going to want to do it. So we found a way that we photograph, upload to our CMS, and it can understand everything from books to printed collateral to my shirt um, without any, any sort of extra code or whatever. So tomorrow, if you wanted to activate something using the Blipper platform, and by tomorrow I mean today in the next five minutes, you could do it without any extra, any extra efforts. Oh. So we have all sorts of analytics tools you probably don't care about. We do have two different versions of our suite. We have Blip Builder, which is a drag and drop. Really cool if you're not really spatially aware. It gives you the opportunity to put flat graphics, buttons, move them up and down in the XYZ plane without any code. It's all visual. Uh, there is a place in there where you can open up and type code. I don't know if that's been released to the public yet, but it's something that we're working on so that it kind of creates 
uh, Unity or Unreal-like in engine environment for, for scripting, but in the browser. All browser-based, all web-based, which is, you know, really kind of what we're going is web technologies are everywhere, and you're probably learning that now with Dr. Rimlin. JavaScript is, it's a lot of fun, and it's everywhere. It's one of the easiest languages, you know, to, to not only learn and script in, but it's also one of those high-level languages that can be easily translated into regular um, regular code so they can write all sorts of JavaScript APIs. And that's what we've written. So the... Oh. <laughs> yeah, it, it just kind of like always works out this way. So last year I came in around this time and Last year, there wasn't the Snapchat and Facebook studios, so I talked heavily about Blipper. Now there's other emerging platforms that are definitely worth checking out that leverage JavaScript. You know, they're, they're also very secluded, so like whatever you create for Facebook can only be used on Facebook. Whatever you create for Snapchat, only on Snapchat. Beauty of Blipper is anywhere anyone can embed a Blipper lens, your content can exist. So our cloud CMS not only allows for you to deploy uh, one code base for a single experience, but it allows you to deploy to multiple SDK uh, installations. So you'd have you know, 50 apps, same experience lives on all of them. Uh, the Blip Builder Script API, it's JavaScript layer. It obscures all the difficult, super technical AR, 3D you know, coding and makes it really easy for you to, to create AR you know, at home. So here's a little example of a cannonball. Uh, I think he shoots it at some point. So you see how it bounces? The reason he had to put it back on the table is because our system doesn't, doesn't truly handle uh, physics. So someone wrote you know, the, the animation here. But where you see that grid, it would assume the floor. And that's the one big thing with augmented reality is perspective. So if you want something to look like it's bouncing off something else, you have to make sure that it's either laying on top of it, if it's marker based, or that you account for a large enough Z depth if it's just world tracking. So, you know, what looks like the floor to me is not the floor to you or you or you. So that's always something to kind of keep in mind and understanding about the spatial awareness. Um, there's two different spaces now when you work with AR, and I don't know why the video is not playing on this one, but you have not only the virtual space, but you still have the screen space. So certain Certain things are better displayed on the screen, you know, utility buttons, uh, settings button. You don't want the user searching your augmented virtual world for the settings button on how to turn off notifications or, you know, whatever, whatever you develop. So that's kind of a, a thing to always keep in mind. You, you do still have the screen, but you don't want to clutter it. So you could put a couple perif peripheral buttons and then put the rest of the experience kind of in the world around you. Uh, this is just, you know, you can generate 3D through code, creating boxes and cubes, pretty standard stuff. Uh, so that's all I got on my presentation. And maybe I'll show you if I can get this to work. There's a little thing we did for Cheez-Its. So this was for the NCAA football season that just passed. The, we had one for basketball, and we'll probably be relaunching the basketball one. There's audio that kind of plays around with it. 
so you can Snapchat style filters or uh, you can pick your colors and play in 3D off the box. So what we're seeing is a lot of brands are, you know, they're choosing to make their, their products interactive because you're, you're creating a new level of interaction with your user. So no longer, well, I shouldn't say no longer. When I first started Blipper, one of the big things that everyone was talking about was like, oh, we're going to use AR to like get new customers. Maybe if your experience is super wow, like Pokemon Go, you know. But what we've learned is we're not a top of the funnel in terms of marketing. AR is great for middle of the funnel. You, kn you have your customer, you know your customer, you want them to interact with your brand, engage with your brand. And that creates more of a, more of a tie, you know, which will increase sales. So for the Porsche project, we saw that um, of the people that scanned, you know, X amount of people completed the, the game, whatever, it led to double the number of test drives in that single month that that activation was on. So that right there should tell you the impact it has with people that are already interested in your brand. Like it'll, it'll lead to people coming through the door, but your brand still has to meet, you know, the AR halfway. It's not, it's not like, oh, we're doing AR, yeah, done. Walk away. No, it, it's 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 definitely a very tight knit engagement because the AR has to match the brand, uh, just like any other app, any other website, any other microsite. There's just a brand new medium for you to build in. And as we move away from the phones, you know, the web's not dying; it's just transforming. All of this is web technology. You know, our servers use use Go. They use PHP. They use you know Node, whatever it takes for the back end. It's just the front end is completely changing. So thank you for your time and answer any questions. So this has got to be one of the most computationally difficult things that anyone's going to do on the go. Yes. And the only reason we've, we're actually seeing it this, like around now, is because cell phones have finally gotten to the point that they can handle doing this. At Blipper, we support everything as low as an S4 and an iPhone 4S, which in America is pretty archaic, but globally, those are really popular phones. So that's around the, the level of device that it takes to, to trigger basic AR. So when it comes to what we do on device and what we do from the compute from the cloud, everything kind of comes from the cloud. It's prepackaged. It's you know we we try to optimize as much as we can before we deploy, so that we're not relying on too much extraneous downloads. AR has got to be light. We've noticed that there's a huge drop off after. I think if if the loader takes over like 30 seconds or something, people will just close it. They'll walk away. They don't care. So generally, if you have a really heavy experience, we'll, we'll segment the loading. So we'll load something up front, get the user engaged, and then in the background, we kind of try to time it out and, and get stuff to load. But we, we don't get to do too much cloud-based computing. All our visual search is there. So when you have the blipper camera lens open, it's, it's ripping frames out of the camera, rescaling them down to like 320 by 320, so really shrinking as much as we can to get a viable photo or image. But that, that's kind of where that trade-off comes from. Is yeah. So um, along the same with Chris's questions, with uh, chip manufacturers now making more of a focus with AR, you know, um, Apple with their most recent chip processors and Apple S and 8, they yeah. dedicated up a certain segment to AR, and then um, Snapdragon with their new chipset, 845, also has dedicated processing for AR. Um, what kind of new emerging things do you think would be possible, or what kind of things does Blipper have coming? Uh, well, right now we're we're looking to integrate AR Core, AR Kit, and all all that because up until now AR Core was only for developers. Only recently was it 
kind of release to the greater community. But talking about processors and chips, I don't think it's so much about a single platform. It's where it's going to take the entire industry because slam tracking is insanely computationally heavy. Uh, what some of these chips now allow you to do is expose that through the SDK instead of having the developer try to program above it. So the phone's already kind of calculating the gyros and stuff, and these chips will, will now allow you to, to serve that up to the user without as much expense, right? Before, the chips were doing that thing, and then on top, you'd have to read from them, which got really computationally expensive. So now I think the big thing is getting that raw, raw feed out is going to help us with SLAM and that sort of technology. And then I also wanted to add, since we're talking about cloud-based, um, like doing the processing on the, on the cloud, um, is 5G making it more cost-effective with future implementations like 5G wireless and stuff? Is that going to make it more um, easier to do, basically, instead of having to rely on device performance? We don't do so much in the cloud, as I was explaining to, to Dr. Rimland, but what it'll help us to do is be able to serve up heavier AR experiences, more immersive, more engaging, because of the faster download time. Right now, we try to peg it at, like, what are we going to be able to download at 3G? So if, if it's not fast in 3G, we, we failed. <laughs> Well, we have other offices. We're oh, global. Okay. We're a global office. I was like wondering that, like, when you're uh, sort of designing some security features that are into your like product, um, what stage of like product development do you like begin? Like, you sort of like planning one, or like after like issues arise, is that when you sort of? So we, we have a whole security team yeah. based out of our London offices. Everything we run is AWS. Our server costs are through the roof. You know, and that's that's one of the <laughs> the problems with. Not being able to do as much on the device as you, you rely on the server for, for cloud-based CMS and things like that. Um, but everything <laughs> we have has like, you know, we, we have our own OAuth protocols. We have all sorts of cryptography based into it. So because there is so much data flying around, you do have to protect it from day one. So from the beginning, everything's encrypted. We don't even support using URLs within a blip that aren't HTTPS. So. Design the AR experiences. Is it supposed to be the same across the board, regardless of like the hardware piece? Said you mentioned things as far back as the S4 and the SM4S. So will that experience be the same with someone that has a more capable phone, like an iPhone 8 Plus, as far as performance? Yes. Um, depends on our market. So it's all about you know know your user. If we're deploying just for the U.S. market, mm -hmm. we could kind of ignore some of those lower end devices and not worry about it, or we'll just fail gracefully. You know, we'll say, this, sorry, but this isn't available on your device. Is, is there um, a push for a more scalable option where, like, the, the uh, software will be like, okay, hey, I see this person has an iPhone 7. We can now either render the image in different quality, like, for basically scaling, better scaling uh, these platforms and stuff. We haven't, really, we haven't really had those sort of issues because it's, like, very targeted niche. It's like you're either going to be in this market or that market or that market. Just make the engagement lighter or, you know, heavier. Uh, the Porsche engagement was targeted at, uh, you know, men aged, you know, 35 to 40, 55, 65, whatever, iPhone, they'll be on Wi-Fi, so the, the, the experience was actually like 12 <coughs> megs, but no one cared because they had the high-end device, you know. You couldn't even open it on some of the lower-end devices. People in the UK offices were like, ah, oh, this, this thing's broken, it just crashes my device. <laughs> Uh, right now we have a whole new face tracking uh, library coming out, so we'll be able to do the Snapchat style tracking. Up until now, it was more like Google Hangouts circa 2003, very flat. You know, we'd throw a 3D model on there, but it wouldn't really track to your face. Now we're going to be able to get, you know, lip definition, nose, eyes, winks, eyebrow raises. Uh, the AR kit and AR core integrations, which will help with more immersive more immersive tech. Beyond that, I can't really talk much about it. <laughs> but there, there's really exciting stuff coming out with AI and, and computer vision that hopefully will change the world, but we'll see. Uh, what apps 
are actually using Blipper's um, uh, SDK. So we're, we're getting ready to launch a huge engagement with Kellogg's based out of the UK. It's going to be a whole educational thing where you collect coconuts, which turn into coins or something like that. There's selfie-facing features. We had a third-party agency that licensed our SDK. They were working with the NCAA for uh, the football championships. And you could scan some of the collateral there. The SDK is only about a year old. And, and we haven't really pushed it I too hard. I'm not going to lie to Slippers when I actually heard about you guys and everything uh, you do. It's, you know, I'm not surprised. Our SDK was kind of like something we didn't really push because we were getting a lot of the bugs out. We, we that, that agency partner helped us realize a lot and of How do you think you're going to be able to compete with um, b bigger companies that have more resources available basically to dedicate to this? So like you mentioned Facebook and you know Snapchat, both of which already have their brands well established amongst the consumer. Both of them already, you know, have that user base. How do you plan to actually compete, I guess, is the question. So this was a mistake we made early on. We thought we were a B2C company. We're not a B2C company. We don't have users, monthly active users like Facebook and Snapchat. We're a platform. So we allow you to better build build AR into your into your application, you know, using simpler tools. So yeah, Facebook, Snapchat, they're they're gonna be leaders. Don't don't ever discount them. But they'll they'll want to keep all the content to themselves because that's where their money is. It's content creation and content sharing across their platform. So very rarely would they they be like, yeah, we'll we'll make this AR thing for everyone to use in every other app so they don't have to use our app. It's that, that's kind of where our edge is, is we're not trying to compete against Facebook and Snapchat. We're trying to go to, so we're, we're doing a project with PwC for, for their internal thing. Um, like I said, we've, we've, we're doing one for Kellogg's. That's kind of where we see it, is helping big brands, big businesses dip their, their toe in AR. Like you don't need to know how to develop all the crazy technology that AR needs, you just need to embed this, and then your front end guys could write JavaScript and, and you know, call it a day. How do you balance, you know, your contract work with innovating, you know, moving forward with your technology? That's, that's a very, very good question. So we actually have separate teams. The team I'm on is a production team or commercialized commercial production team. We have a mirror team in London and Singapore. Our whole goal is to take the tech that the Blipper engineers in London and Mountain View build and commercialize it, evangelize for it. So really segmenting those two things away. Like we have teams that just dedicate on pushing the envelope and, and building new AR technologies. And then teams like mine are trying to make money to pay for those guys. <laughs> So for our platforms and our engine teams, I would say it's more about the AI, more about the 3D and um, is that a? I'm sorry. No, it's cool. Find me on LinkedIn. Find me on Facebook. Reach out. I'm more than willing to speak to anyone. Thank you guys, thank you. And